Well, it's wonderful to be here freezing with all of you um, and celebrating Gettysburg great uh, and to see this fabulous class of 2016, minus, of course, the women's lacrosse team who've once again won the Centennial Championship and will be playing this afternoon. And I know the men won yesterday, overtime. Uh, so uh, both of you in the NCAA Championship, so that's terrific. Got it? It's also a great honor to be here uh, re receiving these degrees with two such incredible public servants as Bob Gates and Wade Henderson. Uh, Dr. Gates has spent his life protecting and defending every person in this country. Dr. Henderson has spent his including and respecting every person in this country. And they are great examples of the kinds of service that you can pro provide as you go forth from here. And I, as I read the list of your accomplishments, what I was most impressed by, I must say, was the fact that almost 90% of you have been involved in community service, which is just fabulous. Congratulations. Because it's true that you can serve in all kinds of ways. And that's what Steve and I want to talk to you about today. Well, thank you, Koki. And again, I want to add my congratulations to the class of 2016. And uh, as Koki mentioned, uh, Robert Gates, Wade Henderson have served in public office. But I want to talk to you about two people who served their fellow men and women in private ways, because you don't have to hold public office to be a public servant. We're just storytellers, and I want to tell you two brief stories. One is about a woman named Irene Goot Updike. She was 17 years old, younger even than you are, today, the graduates. Living in Poland when World War II swept through her hometown of Radom, Poland. She joined the Polish partisans in the, in the forests fighting the Nazis, but when the Soviets came in from the east, she was stopped one night by a group of Soviet soldiers, raped and left for dead in the forests of Poland. But she survived got back to her hometown, and wound up serving, drafted really by the Nazis who were occupying her hometown, to be their servant, to be their waitress at a hotel, serving their meals. And she, outside the window of the hotel, she could see into the Jewish ghetto. She could see the Jews who were being rounded up and imprisoned by the Nazi occupiers, and something broke inside of her. She started stealing food from the Nazi kitchens and slipping them under the gates, under the fences, into the ghetto. Then she started slipping information, secret messages, information she had heard while uh, serving as a waitress for the Nazi high command. And as she put it in her wonderful book, Into My Hands, a resistance fighter was born. A year or so later, she found herself in another Polish town supervising a group of Jewish workers. They were slave workers in a laundry in a town occupied by the Nazis. And word came that the SS was about to invade that town. And there was only one lesson to be drawn from this message. The Jews were about to be eliminated from this town. They would all be slaughtered by the Nazis. And Irene said, this cannot happen. And she went to the Jews of the town, to the Jews she worked with in this laundry, and said, I can help save you. And the leader of the Jews said, how can you help us? You're just a girl. A teenage girl, by this time 18, she was living and working in a villa with the Nazi commander of the, uh, uh, of the region, and she discovered that underneath the house where the Nazi was living were a series of catacombs and cellars, and she brought 12 Jews to those cellars and hid them for nine months. 
underneath the floors of where the Nazi command was having dinner every night, she saved 12 Jewish souls. She was just a girl. But history, history put her in this position to show courage, to show leadership. And then one of the women in the cellar became pregnant and all the Jews said, we have to get rid of the baby, we can't risk it. One cry and we're all dead. And she said, don't give Hitler one more life. Within a few months, the Nazis had been driven out of this town by the Soviets. Irene, again, rescued all of these Jews, got them to the forest where the partisans were hiding, where that mother gave birth to that child, and that child lives today in Israel. Because one girl, one teenage girl, had the courage to defy tyranny. You might not be faced with that kind of challenge in your life, but every one of you will have the opportunity to show bravery and courage at some point. And my other story, very briefly, is about a man named James Reston, who was my first boss. And he was, when I worked for him, the most prominent man in American journalism. And yet every day, he took time for me. He, answered my questions, helped me get an article published, told me to co marry Koki, the best advice I ever got from him. We're about to have our 50th wedding anniversary, so this is probably gonna work out. Steve proposed by saying, oh, all right, Koki. Yeah. <laughs> it was really pretty romantic, I thought, but. And when Scotty Reston died, he asked that the people who carry his casket, his pallbearers from the church were not the Bob Gateses and the Wade Hendersons he knew, although he knew people like that very well and admired and respected them very much. But the people he asked to carry his coffin from the church were the young people he had, who had worked for him, like me. And as I carried his coffin from the church, holding on to the, um, uh, to the handle, it was as if he was speaking to me with one last message. And the message was, young man, at the end of your life, the most important thing you've accomplished are the lives you've touched, the young people you've mentored, your faculty members here know exactly what I'm talking about. You can measure success, you can measure gratification one life at a time, one student at a time. And Scotty sent me this message from the grave and his life was like a pebble in a pond. I've always thought, you throw that pebble into the pond and it causes ripples Ripples echo out from this moment. And my very simple message is be like Scotty, be like Irene Updike, be a pebble in a pond, because if you do that, those ripples of your life will continue to reach shores that you yourself will never see and you will touch lives that you never know. Thank you. But if you want to make waves, not just ripples, go into public service. Because there, both in public policy and private actions, you can have an impact on thousands, if not millions, of lives, uh, as Wade Henderson and Bob Gates have done. You have here the excellent Eisenhower Institute for Public Policy and Leadership, which now includes the Fielding Center for the Study of Presidential Leadership, 
And I saw that our friend Fred Fielding, who's here uh, when he was dedicating it, quoted from Plato, the penalty for wise men who decline to participate in their governance is to be ruled by unwise men. You've spent four years living with the horrible reminder of unwise men. This hallowed battlefield where more than 50,000 casualties occurred. Young men killed or injured because the politicians could not get their act together. They could not get to emancipation without killing more than 600,000 Americans. What an indictment of the lack of wisdom of the people who were then in charge. And we need to make sure that we never see that kind of unwise leadership again. We need you wise young people to serve. I know politics is not something very popular these days, and trust me, I get it. Uh, there are lots of reasons for it. Some of it is that those of us in the media uh, run down people in politics, uh, voters, punish politicians the minute they do something that they think that the voters think are not in their perceived self-interest. The politicians themselves run down the institutions in which they serve, and candidates run against professional politicians as a matter of course. But I would argue that to denigrate the professional is to denigrate the profession, and to show a basic disrespect for government that might be popular, but it's dangerous, as this grim battlefield reminds us. Nothing binds us together as a nation, nothing, except our Constitution and the institutions it created. We have no common ethnicity, no common religion, no common history beyond a couple of hundred years, and these days, not much of a common language. It's the idea of America that Lincoln so famously championed here when he talked about a government by, for, and of the people that creates our common country. That's something that Wade Henderson has spent his life making sure that more, American, more Americans can participate in. And that's why it's absolutely essential to have respect for the Constitution and the institutions that it created. All three branches of government that it created, the executive, where Bob Gates served so well for so many decades, the judiciary, and yes, even the Congress, uh, because in fact, that is the glue. The word means coming together. Those institutions are the place that this country comes together. And that's where, in fact, after these horrible battles, it was in the Congress where the slaves were freed. It was in the Congress in the middle of the 20th century where voting rights were uh, finally uh, expanded. And again, in this 21st century, we need to do it some more. So it is also the place where in private actions every day, helping veterans get their benefits, helping Social Security recipients make sure that they're whole. Little things all day, every day, where thousands of problems get solved. All of you I know will so serve in some way. The musicians among you will enliven our lives. The scientists among you will improve our lives. Those in the humanities will enrich our lives. Those in media studies will inform our lives. But as you go forth from this special place, I really want you to think about taking your talents into public service. Become the wise women and men involved in our governance so that never again we will question whether this nation conceived of liber in liberty can endure. Thank you.